script up with React and Apollo server. Um, hello guys, my name is Rosa Koth and I'm going to be your host today. Happy New Year to all of you. Um, today we are going to have a code lab session on building a full TypeScript app with React and Apollo server. And if you have any question, you can post it on chat box or if you want uh, to unmute yourself, it's okay. Yeah, so uh, let me introduce our speaker today. So the speaker is Timothy. He's a full stack software engineer with over eight years of software development experience in web development. He specializes in front-end engineering with, type, with React and TypeScript. Welcome, Timothy. Thank you, Ross. Happy New Year, all of you, and welcome again to our presentation today. Uh, it's been a long time coming. We've had this conversation with the organizers at LAX for a while, and finally we're here. I'm, I'm glad to be here to present to you guys. As uh, Rose has already briefed, I am a full stack software engineer. I work with my consulting firm called Nairobi IO. And I also contract with a couple other firms locally. I am a full stack software engineer, meaning I do both backend and uh, front end software en engineering. And uh, I have about, I'd say, eight, nine years of experience in the field. I have worked with uh, JavaScript, I've worked with uh, PHP. Uh, lately, I've been doing a lot of TypeScript and I've worked with uh, several other languages like Python, Ruby on Rails. And, uh, but for the most part, JavaScript has been my language because I've done a lot of front end work. And uh, I've worked with React, React uh, framework for the last React uh, library for the last about, I'd say, three, three or four years. Yeah, I think I wasn't a very early adopter of React, but I caught up quite quickly. And it's the one I use most of the time. Right now, I actually do all my front-end work with uh, React when, when I have to use a library. Okay, so um, I'm not sure if I should start right away or we should wait for a few more people. What do you think, Ross? I think we should start because majority of people have joined. Yeah. All right. Again, welcome you all. And uh, today I'm going to talk about building a full stack TypeScript app with uh, React and uh, GraphQL. Um, for those of you who don't know about React, okay, let's start, let's start with it. Let's start with TypeScript. TypeScript is a subset of uh, JavaScript. It's a, it's a, uh, it adds the ability to type hint uh, your types, and it adds a lot of other functionalities on JavaScript, it makes it easier to write your JavaScript. Well, not, not much easier really, but it makes, makes it easy to maintain the code that you write in JavaScript. Um, it's uh, developed by Microsoft, and I think also maintained by Microsoft. And uh, it, uh, it's actually nowadays it's becoming more and more of a standard in the uh, JavaScript ecosystem. And in many companies, they expect you to do to write your JavaScript, your front end in TypeScript. Sorry, guys, I'm trying to mute my phone. Okay. And so uh, unfortunately, I had a presentation that I was doing. I, I had a presentation that I was preparing, it was a chat app, but it, I, I met a bug somewhere and I wasn't able to connect a uh, subscription so that the chat app could be real time. So I had to switch to a different app, which I'm going to present, which is also really nice. It's built in React, TypeScript. Uh, it has a lot of, uh, it, it has some tests as well, and it has GraphQL. So. It's an app uh, that uh, demonstrates, I'm going to share a link and then I'm going to explain what it does. So uh, with that ado, let me just share a link right away. So 
I will start. I will start uh, sharing, sharing the link of the live version where you can see it working. And if you check up the link, you will see a dashboard sort of uh, page. This is a single page web application. It's a dashboard. It's not complete. Uh, in fact, there are no other screens aside from this one. But it's a demonstration of how to build uh, TypeScript app with a with a React and GraphQL. It's backed by a GraphQL server, which uses Apollo Server as the GraphQL uh, framework, and it uses CSS, a, a very simplistic uh, simplistic CSS framework called uh, Skeleton CSS. It's very minimal. It's about 400 lines of code or less. It's actually less than 400 lines of code. So it doesn't use Bootstrap, doesn't use Material or Tailwind or all these other things. And it uses, um, has a, yeah, so there are two parts with this. There's this front end and then there's a back end, which is, I'm going to share a link to the back end. So I think you guys can see the links that I'm sharing on the chat. You can click on click through and see them. And so I'm going to show you, I'm going to do two presentations. One is for the API and the other one is for the front end code. And uh, the reason we had, I, I decided to do a full stack presentation, like to present both the back end and the front end, because nowadays it's becoming more and more necessary for, 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 for for, for, for front-end developers to be able to uh, know how to at least host their apps. I mean, it's it's becoming, when, like, nowadays it's really hard to, like, draw the line between front-end and back-end because there's a lot of overlap. Uh, you have you, you, you have some expectations in the industry, like, such that front-end developers should be able to, like, do server-side rendering of the apps, should be able to consume APIs, should be able to, uh, build like uh, demo projects that uh, demonstrate how to use an API and how to apply, uh, like say GraphQL and stuff like that. So it's it's really necessary if you're doing a front end to be able to like have a grasp of at least how to build a GraphQL server and uh, consume it. Yeah. So I will start by digging into the code, and meanwhile. You guys can also check the code, it's on GitHub. So for the, for the API code, there you go, share the link. And for the, for the front-end code, uh, there you go, you have of the link to the front-end code that is on GitHub. So if you can, if you want to follow along, you can clone that code and check out what I'm talking about, as I'm talking about it. So I am going to share my screen in a bit. Uh, meanwhile, if you have questions, kindly just follow through. Um, kindly just post the questions on the chat box, and I'll be able, uh, I'll be able to get back be able to get through, get get uh, go through the questions and answer after my presentation. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen uh, right now. Rose, can you confirm that you're able to see my screen? Yeah, I can be able to see it. Okay. So, here, and I'm getting a network. If you can kindly mute some of the mics so I don't get the echo to be. Hello. Okay. Hello. Yeah. 
All right. Yeah. Yeah. Just make sure all the mics are muted so that I don't get an echo in my presentation. So right now I'm looking at the client code and on a different screen, I am going to show the API code. So let me just start with the API code really quick and then I get to the client code. So this is the API code, as you can see, cloned from GitHub. I mean, I, I developed it on this machine, so pushed it on GitHub. But this is the entry file. You can see it's a .ts file, index.ts, meaning it's a TypeScript, TypeScript file. And let me just start with the package JSON so that you see what we have here. These are the scripts for running the app. And these are the packages that you're going to rely on to build the backend. Very simple backend. You can see it's not loaded with packages. Uh, but this is the main culprit here, Apollo server. This is, this is the sort of framework that will be able to um, return GraphQL to the client requests. And this, this, one, this one is sort of a helper. It, it, you, you, you need it when you're using uh, type or RM and type GraphQL. Type GraphQL and type or RM are, are uh, type or RM is an object relational mapper. It connects your, so when you, when you, the difference between a GraphQL and a REST sort of system is because uh, when, you, when you get re, uh, request on a REST, REST, uh, REST uh, API, those requests are mapped to functions on a controller. And, but on a GraphQL, those requests are mapped to resolvers and uh, resolvers are, are actually classes that uh, reflect, sort of like represent the, the models that are on your database. And resolvers are, uh, will provide functions to, um, to mutate, which are called mutators, to, to actually change the data in your database and to uh, return the data from your database. Which, and those functions are called queries. So I'll show you examples of those. So type GraphQL allows you to do that and it has really good, um, it has really good, uh, like it, it, it works with TypeScript really well and same as type ORM. And they use uh, decorators, which is um, some pattern in uh, a new version of JavaScript. And we're also going to use a Postgres database. So if you want to run this project and uh, not have a headache, I would require you just install Postgres in your laptop and uh, you just go and uh, do yarn, just go and do yarn, um, and, and just just run yarn or npm and then you will install all, install all these packages and then you can run you can run a yarn dev so that you run the project locally it, yeah first thing install postgres let me just write it here install then the second thing uh, create a database on postgres and name it say Phoenix, and then uh, you, you have a file here called orm.example.json. And then on that file, once you rename it, fill in the, data, the database details here, and you can change the database name to whatever you give, give there. And uh, your username and your password, and then you're good to go. Then you can just run uh, yarn. yarn uh, if you haven't run the yarn, you can, you can run it here first, and then here you come and run yarn there. Then you your, your API will be running, I think, from then. Can just quickly just demonstrate that. Good. And as you can see down here. Ross, can you kindly just check that the, all the other mics are muted? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we have someone. Uh, you have someone just messing up with the presentation. I don't know what's going on. Kindly just remove them. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right. So I was uh, I just run Yam Yam Dev here, and as you can see, uh, based on the settings that you have on your ORM config, you'll be able to see these uh, SQL statements that are being run. Basically, it's a setup process, and Hold on a second. As you can see here, they start, the server has started on this port. And I will I will go back to index.ts here. Yeah. So I just run through this really quickly because it's supposed to be a front-end presentation. So I won't dwell too much on the API. So here, the first thing is Apollo server that you will import. And this one, it's necessary, it's required so that the type ORM and type GraphQL can come up properly. Uh, I am not quite sure why it's necessary, but if you don't, if you don't have it here, it's okay. Um, sorry, guys, I don't know what's going on. I think that people just trying to mess up the presentation and kindly just make sure. Rose, can you just make sure you're not getting these people back on the call? Yeah, sure. And also, yeah, Timothy, don't let me. Timothy, can you make your fonts bigger? Uh, My font? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. I'm going to yeah. <laughs> Okay, so as you can see, this is the entry file for the API. I think my font is big enough, Ross, is that right? Um, you can increase it a bit. Big enough. Yeah, Hello. sure, it is. Yeah, it is. Kindly, can we just uh, prevent more people from joining? And the ones who are making noise, can we just remove them from the meeting? All right. Okay, guys, um, you can see this entry file. When you're running an Apollo, Apollo server, uh, you... All right. Okay, uh, can you do, just don't let them in again? That is really annoying. I don't know what's happening. Okay. Yeah. Um, so here we go. First things first, you're going to create a connection. And this function comes from type ORM, which is basically it's connecting to your database. Because type ORM is the object relational mapper that connects your um, type GraphQL, your, your, your GraphQL requests to whatever is in the database. You can be able to get re your request map to stuff in the database. And then here you define your schema and you define your schema by, you define your, your schema by basically com combining all the resolvers from different models in your database. Now here we go. Uh, this is, for example, this clinics resolver is one of the models that I have in, a, in my database. I have a list of clinics, like a table for clinics on my Postgres database. I have issues, I have visits, and I have staff, staffs. So all this needs to, like, you need to create resolvers for them. And then this is the, this is how you create, like you combine all these resolvers and you make a schema. And then you pass this schema to Apollo server, and then you run the Apollo server on a certain port. You can decide whichever port. Alternatively, I've seen people also use Express uh, to, and then they use Apollo server as an add-on. Yes. 
but in my opinion that usually doesn't in my opinion i i just don't find it to be useful to like uh, have a server as an express as an add-on on express i i just prefer run it by itself because i'm trying to do the like the minimal the the the, the most minimal version of it okay so i will just click on one of the okay so here we are uh this is a clinic resolver right here it's basically a class uh, and these are you use decorator decorators uh, to basically make it an entity that it will be used by type, type graphql and type orm but because both of them actually use of uh, decorators so and uh, you use the entity you extend the entity here so that you can call functions without using the query builder query builder is a okay uh, here we go uh, so you define different fields in your database this way and uh, you have to actually de define the types for the fields. And the cool thing about using type ORM and type GraphQL is that once you write them, once you when, once you declare them on your on your model, you won't need to uh, create a different schema again to represent how your database looks. You only this is the only basically this is the only place that I define the schema of the data in my database. And down here, I will uh, just ignore this part. Uh, I will define the resolver. Now the resolver is basically how functions are, how different requests from GraphQL will be resolved. You can, you can just understand it that way. It's like, if someone requests for a list of clinics, how do we, uh, how do we return that request? And, you usually uh, in a REST system, you will use a function that is on a controller. So like just assume this resolver just stands for like a controller. And then now there is usually like the is a, is a parameters or arguments that you send to a controller, say when you're requesting data from a specific start date to an end date. Now these are the same, this is just basically the same way. So this is a function on the resolver that will return a list of clinics and it will turn clinics from a start date to an end date. And you have to type hint that, as you can see, this is like how you do that. And you, this is like basically the version of, say, using interfaces on TypeScript. But now on TypeORM and TypeFQL, this is how you will do that. You'll have to uh, use this decorator here, uh, argument types so that uh, they can, so that basically you can be able to type hint uh, your, your arguments and uh, yeah, it won't bring up an issue with uh, uh, type GraphQL on the resolve. Now, here, yeah, as you can see, this function returns a promise and uh, you, you'll just use, now this is, this is why we were using a base entity here so that you can just call directly on clinic, which is basically the class right here. You can call such functions as uh, say find you can basically fetch data from uh, the clinics model and basically this this represents the database table called clinic and uh, you fetch data from it and uh, just ignore this part here and if you also want to fetch relations uh, on the same you will uh, you'll just include them you include them here in this array and the relations themselves are it, you have to have defined the relation as a field. Say, uh, let me just show you. Yeah, right here. So this is a one-to-many field. So a clinic can have many visits. So I forgot to tell you what the project is about. Sorry, guys. So the uh, project is about like uh, it, it. It enables. Uh, say an administrator of several clinics to be able to see clinics 
to, to be able to see how clinics are performing from different areas. So if you go back to the screen, uh, that had the presentation running right here, great. So you could be the management manager of several clinics and you wanna see how your staff are performing in different clinics. And uh, these are different clinics. So if you click on one clinic, you can see uh, different issues that pertain to the staff in that clinic and the period uh, between which you're monitoring the performance of your staff and the performance of a clinic. So for this one clinic right here, you have this many visits that happened during this period of time. And you can see on this same but database, I mean, this same dashboard, you can see different issues that you wanna like filter by different issues. You wanna filter like how many, say how many uh, issues of careless waste disposal happened on this one clinic between 26 June to 31st July. And if you just make a selection, say just come here and change from uh, say July 1st to July 31st of 2020, you'll see that number changes and uh, also the graphs also change. So there's a lot of, a lot of data changes here. You can, you can imagine this, there's the data that represents footfall, basically the number of people that visited the clinic, patient satisfaction, which is like an average of the uh, net promoter score for each clinic, so for each visit and the revenue that was made in that period of time. I mean, there's, there's data that comes to graph here, there's data that comes to uh, populate uh, be before these uh, buttons. And there's also the performance of the staff themselves. Like if you notice, if whenever you change something here, the performance of this staff will also change like this, information that is uh, on this table will change. Efficiency, the number of issues they, that have been reported ab about them and stuff. So, I mean, there's just so much data that goes to populate this, this one dash dashboard at any given point. And whenever you make a different selection, you'll see stuff just changes here and on the graph. So, in such a... In such a situation, if you were to do this with the REST, with the REST uh, API, it will mean you'll have to query data for different parts of this dashboard. Uh, you'll have to do that several times. And in that case, you'll have so many HTTP calls happening on one page, and it will slow down the loading of this page. And uh, the performance of the of this of this website will be just uh, slow, and I mean people will be frustrated by how it performs. And it will not be as snappy as say when you make a different selection here, and you can see things just change almost immediately. So what you are doing right now, as I'm presenting this uh, API, is basically I'm trying to show you how to create an API, GraphQL API like this one. So right now, for instance, if I if I want to fetch clinics, I'll have to pass start date and then date. And this is exactly what I'm doing here. So this is a timestamp of a date and uh, say the start date and that's the end date. And if I just query that and I, I request whatever fields I want for the for this selection. I'm not sure if you can see that. So you can see the return, the data that is being returned here whenever I, I make that request. And if I make a different request, I, I get different data. And yeah, basically that's how it works. And I can also create, if I wanted to, I could create a clinic. Uh, the way to do that, just create an application. And Right in there, we'll just uh, create a clinic, call create clinic, and I will uh, just, uh, within the buckets, I will need to provide location for the clinic, say, in the copy, the string, 
and as you can see I'm painting already because this is not how you present screens you have to actually use double quotes. and what else if I want to see what else is available I will just I'll just do a, a control space or a command space using a mark and I see I'm required to provide a name the clinic you can call the clinic of uh, Lux and I also need to provide what needs to be returned after I create a clinic. And uh, right there, I can see the request for an ID and name and uh, request for education. So I do that. Uh, just call that. You can see a new clinic was created and these are the details of the clinic and i can also just fetch clinics you can see we have we don't we didn't have that clinic here but if i request that again you'll see a new clinic has been added to the list clinic number seven slacks it's in Nairobi. And if i if i go to I go to if I go back to my my resolver here you can see this is where it was created I required I was requesting for a name and a location this function needs a name and a location and it will create a clinic and return that clinic simple as that anyway I think this if you just clone that code and you just go through it you'll be able to understand how type ORM and type GraphQL work together with a polo server to uh, enable you to make requests and uh, return GraphQL and also just to modify data in your database. Yeah, and how they, they also seamly, seam, seamlessly integrated with Postgres. The, the beauty about type ORM is that it's, it's, it's one of those object relational mappers. It, I think it's the only one in fact that can also work with MongoDB. Uh, just to give you a small brief, if you just check, I had like a link that I was checking last night about. Hmm. Okay, boring. So, yeah, great. So this is the trend as like, let me just share this link right away here. Yeah, check that. We would see like the most common ORMs and uh, different tools in the on NPM that enable you to write, I mean, create GraphQL servers. And you can see how they compare in terms of like popularity on GitHub and the number of stars and issues. It's just basically a, a snapshot of how the ecosystem is right now. Now, I just go directly, just jump to the front end. So, if you have questions, kindly let me know. Take a moment, look at the code, see how uh, you can improve it. And also, if there's anything about the code that you don't understand, can you just reach out and throw a question? So, right here, I will um, I'll switch to the client version of the code. And this is the entry file again, but before we go there, I'll just go right directly to the package JSON. And as you can see, this is a description of the project again. It's an analytics platform to help in the measurement and optimization of key metrics that can improve operational efficiency of our clinical staff. And these are the different, different packages that I'm using on the front end. Uh, Ignore, I think most of these up to here, because these are these are type. This this ones right here they provide type definitions for Jest, Node, React, and basically this these ones enable you to see uh, type, like to get type hints for different functions within Jest, Node, and all these other packages, and you only need them because you're using TypeScript. And uh, 
These ones right here, these ones are for GraphQL code gen, which allows you to generate, uh, it allows you to generate code hooks uh, that you can use within your GraphQL, uh, GraphQL front end. I mean, within your front end to be able to consume a GraphQL endpoint. And you will use Apollo client as well. Uh, as you can see on the back end, on the back end you require Apollo, you require Apollo, Apollo server. Right here. And this is the front end. Front end you need Apollo client version three. I think is the most recent version. And Apex Jax, uh, okay. Apex Jax enable me to do, to do, to do, to do, to do, to do, to do these ones. Oops. There you go. So Apex Jax enable me to do these charts right here, these mini charts. Uh, Date FNS, this is a date library. It's very powerful. Uh, it enables me to convert my dates, especially when I'm dealing with such, such an component here and all these mutations. And GraphQL, you definitely need that on your front end as well. React and React Apex charts, uh, React DOM, and Flood Picker. Flood Picker allows you to pick a date here. And React scripts allows you to run your React front end. Basically, this front end was generated using create React app. I think it's just a very simple, it's a simple command you need to run in your starting off this project. Uh, create React app. Uh, use, I'm pretty sure it's something like template uh, type script. Maybe wrong, but I think you can check that up. If you want to create, this is basically this is how to bootstrap a React app. Oh yeah, you you have to you have to provide the name of it. So say so when you're trying to bootstrap or create a React app in the front end using TypeScript, uh, you can just confirm that by googling how to start and yeah, and then React scripts provide. Uh, all that um, abstraction. And then I, I also use styled components uh, to style my front end components and TypeScript, definitely. Now, this is the entry file uh, where we start. See right here, this is the first file that is um, called running the front end. And unfortunately, you know, when I increase the size, of my, oh good, there you go. So you can you can see how this entry file works. First thing you import Apollo client and Apollo provider and this cache provider from Apollo client. And this is how you initialize your client. And uh, you also provide the URI, URI for where the client will be hosted and you render your React DOM, you, you render your React app uh, this way by wrapping it with the Apollo provider, yeah, which is fetched from here. And basically this one provides, it provides uh, the GraphQL bindings to your React app. And you provide the client, uh, which is what you created here. Yeah, so you can just go check Apollo client on apollo.com and see what it, what it does for your app. Apollo server and Apollo clients just on apollographql.com. Uh, Good. All right. Um, so I'll just go jump in right to the app itself. Okay. 
Right. Yeah, so right here, as you can see, we this is the this is the file that is the first component that is rendered on index. And these are the different components that build it up. And basically this file up.tsx represents what you're looking at right here, the whole page. It's basically this whole page. And I'll just run through it really quick. Um, so these are the different components that are used there. And we use style components and skeleton CSS and uh, sort of day and end of day from data FNS. Now you, this is a functional component. This is how you type hint a functional component with TypeScript. And you uh, here you create the first two dates. Uh, yeah, you 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 add them to your state, then. These are functions to set date range. Basically, these functions, like set date range here, this is a function that will be called whenever you make a switch here or you make a, you make you pick one of these options right here. I'll show you how that goes. And that issue is whenever you make, make a selection, one of these selections here, you change an issue. So that will be called. Then set clinic does the same thing for when you switch a clinic one of these places. And you fetch data now. Here, uh, as you can see, each one of these, each one of these functions, set date range, set issue, and set clinic. These are the like the main operations that happen that make the data change. And once one of these operations is called, the fetch data is called, as you can see, fetch data is called immediately after any of this happens. And, oh yeah, this is this is a fake, this is a fake, uh, like it's a fake version because it's not actually talking to the Apollo server. But for this set date range, for this one bit, I actually talk to the Apollo server. And how do I do that? I set the start date and I set the end, end date. And whenever I do that, I automatically, once I just change the date, it automatically queries that from the GraphQL. Queries, uh, queries are different uh, set of data from GraphQL. Now, this is the component structure for this uh, page right here, as you can look at it. And just go through it really quickly. There's a wrapper, there's a left navigation, uh, wrap is a whole thing, left navigation is this bit here. We have these folders and stuff. Then you have a container, and that's basically the rest of the bit. Header is this white part all, all the way up here. Content is what you have beneath the header. And the title, that's, that's right here. Body covers the rest of the bit. And then you have the nav container, which is Clinics nav, which is the part that covers this list of clinics, six of them here. And then this other bit, I just ran out of, uh, I ran out of, I ran out of names to call it. They call it inner. So right here you have the inner part. And all these, most of them, in fact, these are styled components. They basically just divs that have been styled to. Uh, look and behave in a certain way, and that's why they look they 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 look like components. And yeah, basically we're using style components, and that that's what allows us uh, styled dot. Yeah, it it allows us to do what you see here: styled dot div, styled dot div, styled dot h two for the title, uh, styled dot div for the body and stuff. That's all that comes from. Uh, the capabilities that style components allows us to do. Basically, it just allows us to style our divs and allows us to style other components, other native HTML components like H2, could use inputs, buttons, and stuff, all that. And you're also importing the CSS, skeleton CSS, which are very 
very simple uh, CSS. It's a very simple CSS uh, library. As you can see here, I just downloaded it the other day. It's, it's actually less than 400 lines. I actually added my own. I added a lot of a lot of uh, my own adjustments here, but it's very minimal. And yeah, imagine just having that and being able to have all this. And it, it can even get smaller than that. And the cool thing about this is that it's also responsive. So if you are to uh, check the, let's do, yeah, let me, let me just switch from here. Yeah, as you can see, this page is responsive. I'm looking at the dev uh, dev tools from Chrome, and as I as I change the size of the width, as I change the width of the website, different different parts of the uh, page change, and it becomes more more responsive as you go to a mobile scale. And if you switch to a totally mobile scale here. Uh, you can switch to see how it looks on a mobile phone. Yeah, all this is enabled by using Skeleton CSS. It's an alternative to using Bootstrap. If uh, you've used Bootstrap before, you know how that works. Now, um, I'm supposed to show you how GraphQL presents data on the front end. Great, and you have to remember that we have Apollo provider, which uh, uses this Apollo client, which is basically the API. As you can see, you, you're on the entry file of the front end, but you're using the URI of the API. This is the API that you have right here. Sorry, yeah, this is the API, but you're on this page using Apollo client to talk to this API. That's exactly what's happening here to explain it in layman's language. And you're also using in, in memory cache, which is which allows you to not have to re-query stuff that is already on the, has already been queried before uh, on the front end. So yeah, this Apollo provider here basically allows you it it provides the data, yeah. That's how you should. It 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 creates, it's it uh, creates a context whereby the data from GraphQL API is available in your app component. And how do you know it's available? Because um, if you look at the app component, and you say you use. Um, hold up! Hold up! Hold up! Uh, oh yeah, so for any of these components that are uh, sub-components of app, say for instance, you use a Clinix nav, go to this Clinix nav. Um, <clears throat> you can take props and yeah, these props so they've been defined here, but you should, yeah, you could, uh, I mean, the, the data is already here since you're using uh, the provider. So you have like, so if you go to this, to this graphs or the table, the staff table or the clinics navigation, all this data is being loaded from the Apollo server. So without the Apollo server running, you won't have this data. Yeah, and now I'll just, because the rest of these components are style components, I'll just go to clinics now and demonstrate how that works, how it's able to, when you change one of these, how you're able to get different data. So right here. Yeah, so you, you're looking at the clinics now component, which is also a React functional component. It takes props, and this is an interface that type hints your props. Provide uh, a type. Yeah, you basically define the types for your for the fields in your props, and 
here you can see you're creating states for the current ID. This is the ID for the clinic that you're dealing with at any given point. And use, use get clinics query. Now this is a hook that is provided by, uh, if you just check this up, it's coming from generated.tsx. So how do you get that? Now this is this is like the coolest part about using like that. You will find yeah, crazy people are back. Hey guys. Okay. Uh, Yeah, so, hello, Rose, are you there? Hello? Yes, I'm there. Yeah, hello. try to make sure hello. this guy, guy by the name of Luan uh, doesn't get back in. Kindly. I mean, yeah. it's just too much. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm not sure if, I mean, I mean, I don't know. I don't really understand how he's able to come back. Because you have to let him in, right? Yeah. Okay, just prevent that from happening. Okay, so I'll go back to the package one. Uh, we had this package here that I didn't talk about. GraphQL code gen. Let's just go check up what it does. Uh, learning about being a front-end developer, and basically being a full, full site developer in general. You, you don't have to um, you don't have to beat yourself up too much if you if you don't know about some things like there's just so much so much to be learned like every other day like today I was reading a joke by someone said if anytime you uh, anytime you anytime you say you say JavaScript like three times in front of a mirror a new framework is developed <laughs> so. I mean, there's just so many frameworks out there, so many toolkits to use in the JavaScript ecosystem. Uh, you just have to check them up. It's it's not shameful. It's not uh, you shouldn't feel bad when you have to check things out. But yeah, this code generator allows you to generate code, uh, like the hooks that you just saw here. Uh, like this hook, I didn't actually need to write this hook, which was generated on this file and how that happened as you can see here this is all oh, this is uh this is just the definition for the hook this is a different hook and these are all as you can see we have a lot of hooks on this page and types and all this i didn't have to write this by hand what happened is that i created uh this query graphql file here uh, and I defined different um, param arguments. I mean, I just defined my queries. Like, so a query, for example, to get clinics would require me to pass a start date and an end date. And this is the return that you expect from getting, yeah, requesting get clinics. And this is a different query for getting issues, getting stuff, and and, the, and so on and so on. So I just needed to write this. And even when I wrote this, I was basically just copying from what we have, what we have here. So if you just check this page here, clinics.api, yeah, clinics-api.teamstraston, you, you come to this part of the schema, just click on schema here, you can see the different, uh, you can just see the schema that is expected whenever you're making a query, Teacher? Teacher? Algum hacker divulgou seu link da sua sala? Algum hacker divulgou seu link da sua sala? Por isso que tem gente entrando. Ross? Speaking in Brazil? Yeah. Can you mute this guy? Yes, he's been muted. And can, you, can you remove him from the 
call Portuguese Brazil. Portuguese Brazil. Yeah. Yeah. And it is. Okay. Yeah, at this point I don't I don't expect new visitors to the call. So if someone missed, they just missed. They will just find the live stream on YouTube and they I mean they will find the video on YouTube and they can watch it later. So kindly just don't let more people into the call. All right. So I just needed to write my queries on this queries.graphql file here. And I will uh, I will I will install I will install this. Yeah, there's a lot of things to be done. I will install GraphQL code gen, CLI, basically the command line interface for GraphQL code gen and TypeScript. Uh, for I think this is the TypeScript uh, binder for GraphQL code gen. And yeah, I'll just install all these four packages as is required from the documentation. Sorry. Yeah, and then I will uh, I will create this file whereby I will. So actually, it it generates this file itself, but then I will I will fill in the schema for where I expect my GraphQL server to be hosted. So now, if I'm talking about if you if you're talking about like the like if you if you're developing on the local host, my GraphQL server will be on port five thousand, but when it's in production. Uh, which is basically this part to be here, but you won't really need to generate code for your, you won't need to generate your hooks when you're on production. You only need to use the code gen, GraphQL code gen on the dev version, on, the, on your development environment. And this is the reason why we have, actually this one should, be, should actually be on dev dependencies. Yeah. And once you generate, uh, so yeah, you, you define where the queries are listed on which document, and that is basically this for me. And you, you you define what you expect to be generated, and this is this file, and uh, whether you want components to be generated, higher order com higher order uh, components or hooks. So the only thing I needed here was the hooks because I needed the hooks to be able to plug in. A GraphQL uh, context. Yeah, that's it. So if uh, we go back to Clinics now, I'm able to use get Clinics query, and I can get I can fetch data back. Fetch data back from this. Yeah, from this uh, hook, and I can use that data. Uh, yeah, I can use that data right if that data exists. I can I can get the clinics field in that data, and I can map through it and list. For so for every clinic, I create a button, and I I present the visits, the number of visits in a clinic, and the name of the clinic. That's that's basically what you have in. Here, the number of visits in a clinic and the name of the clinic itself. So yeah, as you can see here, Lux Clinic was created. This is awesome. Uh, I'm not sure I'm the one who did this or someone else did it. Uh, right. So this is the magic that you get from using Apollo Client and yeah, wrapping your you wrapping your wrapping your up in this Apollo provider context. You do that you get this such magic of being able to pull your code without using without having to pass props like from different like, yeah if, if you didn't have if you didn't have this context you'll have to pass props to the app component which you'll need to pass props to the clinic stuff uh, right here that would be just too much you just yeah too clunky. Yeah, so this is a, yeah, I wanted to demonstrate how 
you can be able to change the date and that affects yeah that affects the the data that is coming from graphql so so for every button as we have here every button has an on click event and when you click on the button you you call this change click function with a click id the clinic id so you pass the clinic id to the change click clinic function which is here and this function basically calls the prop uh yeah pro the function that has been passed as a prop which is set clinic with the clinic id and that prop is what we have yeah set clinic so set clinic um references this set clinic function that is up here and yeah that calls the fetch data it it it, gener it, it uh, triggers a fetch for new data and if you look at something like say changing the date Date and date. Yeah, let me let me just use this monitoring period. Um, so if you go to the monitoring period component, which is this one here, the one that has the switcher for dates under date range, uh, you go to any of these buttons, say the date, week, month, or year button. If you just click on set date, set day, uh, that one brings you to this function here, which calls the set date range on the prop. And if you go back to the monitoring period, if you call set date range, call this function here, which is the top, takes the start date and the end date. And if both of them are defined, it says the start date and the so this is the reason why I'm defining my start date and the, my end date on the on the main comp on the app component because anytime this this uh, this state changes, new data is fetched. That is basically how it works, and it's automatic. I don't need to change. I don't need to like make any like request to a GraphQL endpoint. It just changes by itself. Anytime you make, you, you do a set to start date or set end date, new data is fetched. So I know it's a bit complex if you if you if it's the first time you're using uh, GraphQL or you're seeing this, but there's a lot of magic that is happening that I also don't like. I don't totally fully understand everything, but I just know how to, how to navigate around it, and it just works for me. And if you check the code, if you don't know the code uh, and you just follow the instructions, you'll be able to get to this point and be able to learn really quick. So uh, with that said, I think I'll just present one more component, which is the staff component or I think this is actually the one that has a lot of functionality right here. But yeah, I can also present the graphs which are here. So this one's also take the start date. So you can see all my components, they take the start date and the end date. Why am I doing this to the child components? Because whenever I pass this start date and the end date, that means whenever these props change, they, these components will have to be rendered. And yeah, this is like the magic for like, like, like what's, what's making my entire dashboard responsive like whenever i change something here that affects the start date which is up here and the end date and when that state changes all of these components they fetch the new data from graphql that's just automatic for me all right uh rose i think i'm done with the presentation i'll just go go to check the if there are any questions that are posted here i'll just check them up and yeah, they, there was a question from Edwin Kamau. Yeah. Uh, she, sorry, he asked, can you highlight how you are passing in state to React components? Yeah, and I think 
that is exactly what I was trying to show right now. Like, in fact, since I had written this code like a few a, a few weeks back, I was thinking I wrote props, but now I just realized I was just using the context and I was using GraphQL data from the context. It's just automatic. I don't need to pass props. That's the beauty of uh, the pattern that I'm using right now. You don't need to pass props. You just need to plug into the hooks. And yeah, what you need to do is what you're seeing right here. So whenever you need to get new data, say you need to get fresh data for this bit for the clinics, say the fresh, fresh uh, names for the clinics or fresh number of visits for clinics, you just need to plug into the hook. You just get clinics query. It's a hook that is that is generated by uh, me using the GraphQL code gen. It's really so powerful. This is what you're having here. Generates code for my GraphQL schema and operations with a simple CLI. And then once it generates that, you just plug into those hooks and you're good to go. Edwin, can you unmute yourself? Is Edwin there? Hello. All right. Yeah, is there another is there another question from the from the chats? Oh yeah, someone asked to resend the GitHub links. And I'm just gonna do that right away. API. There you go. And client. There you go. All right. Any more questions? Yeah, there is a question from Edwin. He uh -huh. says he he says he has a problem with the microphone. That's why he can't unmute himself. Okay. And then he asked on your components next to your import, there are size of package. Is that an extension? Yeah, that's an that's a VS code extension. It's called I can I remember the name of the extension? It's uh so the extensions I'm using right now. There is import cost. This is the name of the extension. Basically gives you an idea of the cost of importing different packages in your components. Yeah, also using bracket pair colorizer, debugger for Chrome, ES seven. GraphQL, we definitely need the GraphQL so that when you are say on the, they're on the queries.graphql file, you'll be able to see syntax highlighting from your, for your GraphQL files. Yep. I wish I could see the list of all attendants somewhere. Oh yeah, I can see them. <laughs> okay, this is good. So, any more questions, guys? There's no such thing as a stupid question. And I I can just maybe see if there's something else I had. Yeah, also just like, you can ask me how I set all this up. I, or where I learned how to do this. So there's a couple of tutorials that I followed in order to get where I am right now. 
uh, one of them is um, is a course by this guy called Ben Howard. Um, he has he's really good at like making tutorials about React, GraphQL, and he's also really really good. He's, he's, he's like you you don't get bored watching his tutorials. So you can see, you can see some. Um, Let's go check uh, TypeScript. Oh, oh yeah, this this is gonna be really good. So if you wanna learn about TypeScript, like a, a a good introduction to TypeScript, go check this video. This is like the best value I can give you guys. I know my presentation may may not even provide enough value, but this let's go check that. is really powerful in like 20 seconds you're going to get a good overview of what TypeScript is all about and how to use it with react and then there's another one i mean if, if you just go check like just go search on youtube uh, typescript i mean all about typescript and stuff that uh ben Howard does i mean videos that he has posted himself you can get a lot of value there and also he is the one that introduced me to using GraphQL uh, with uh, GraphQL with TypeScript and type GraphQL. Yeah, they, like there's this tutorial here that is of like 13 hours long. He goes through through like creating a React app with GraphQL and TypeScript. He is very well versed with the su the subject and yeah, he's, he's really good. You're pretty much gonna like this tutorial, so. So we have more questions. Can you kindly repeat the difference between TypeORM and GraphQL? Yeah, so GraphQL is a query language. It's like a standard for interacting with APIs. So there's just, like I think two main standards uh, when you interact with APIs is the REST and there's GraphQL. Or there used to be others, but yeah, they don't matter no more right now. So you have uh, GraphQL as a query language for interacting with the uh, servers and being able to fetch data that only the data that you need and no, not more, more than that. So I had written some definitions somewhere. Let me see if I can pull them up really quickly. Oh, there you go. So TypeScript, strict syntactical, syntactical superset of JavaScript. And it adds optional static typing to the language, all right? Uh, this is why you have, for example, in um, here, of such things as this, such things as this. This is what is called type hinting. You're able to provide types for different arguments, different functions, different things in your code. You're able to declare the types. And when you declare the types, you won't, for instance, uh, at some point, you won't assign clinic ID to an integer because you may look at it and assume it can take either an integer or a string, and that's going to mess you up down the line when you're using an integer and then it expects a string. So, yeah, so type, TypeScript allows, I mean, uh, enforces this. This is why it's strict. This is what it's strict here. It enforces syntactical, sy syntactical, I mean, it enforces use of types in JavaScript. And yeah, it has uh, other bits uh, of uh, yeah, benefits to JavaScript. React, a JavaScript library for building user interactive user user interactive user interfaces. Interactive user interfaces. Many of you are already familiar with it. Uh, if you've been sticking along for the entire conversation with API, and Graph GraphQL is a querying language for the data in your API. Clients ask for exactly what they need and nothing more. Um, Node.js is a backend JavaScript runtime. 
you're using Node.js under the hood. When you're using Apollo server, you have Node.js under the hood. Style components allow you to style your components using JavaScript. And Skeleton CSS is a featherweight responsive CSS framework. Apollo server, open source, spec compliant GraphQL server that's compatible with any GraphQL client, including Apollo client. All right. Uh, I will actually just copy all these. I'm pretty sure you can find them on, on the internet. I just don't want to force you guys to read them. Uh, I'll read them for you. There you go. OK, another question. How to one debug type script to ensure data actually gets to component? Hmm. How, how, and how to debug? Let me, let me assume you're asking how to debug TypeScript. And these are two different questions, how to debug TypeScript and how to ensure data actually gets to components. Uh, I think one, one thing to do is to make sure you're passing the right types. And I think maybe, Edwin, if you, mind, if you don't mind, kindly just rephrase your question, I think it will help. Meanwhile, I'm going to share another link. I think this is one of the videos I watched. Oh, uh, it talks about GraphQL. Yeah, this one. Guide to the GraphQL ecosystem. This one is really, really smart. You, you just get to understand why I'm using, for example, type ORM. And not I hope you guys make a lot of value from this, like you benefit from this uh, information. All right, Eden. You can send your question. And if someone has any other questions, kindly uh, feel free to share. OK, there's a question from Petit Emmanuel. Where can I get mentorship for web development? Mentorship for web development. I think uh, Lux is already providing mentorship. There is a, you have a mentorship program that you guys are working on right now. Um, yeah, it's really, yeah, thanks, Haron. Yeah, there's a boot camp uh, that Haron and Rose and the team are working on. So you can get some really good mentorship. Yeah, I, I think the other thing to, one, one advice I would give as someone who has, I think, more experience in the field is just try different things. Try, try to just write some code. And whenever you face a bug, ask questions. It's always so much easier to answer to specific questions. So when you're a senior engineer, for example, it's so much easier to answer to, so much easier to answer to specific questions from juniors who are trying to learn than to just say, um, I want you to be my mentor. Like, how do I go about it? And don't uh, don't expect someone to just dedicate time without you having specific questions that you are, uh, you are, you are asking them about a certain field. Yeah. Yeah, I think Lux is yet to respond to the boot camps. So that's that. Oh yeah, there's something I wanted to uh, promote. Um, so I, yeah, I've already told you about like NPM trends and Yeah, 
This is stuff that I was using to prepare the previous presentation. Yeah, these are some of the tips I wanted to share with you guys. I'm just gonna paste them right in there. Yeah, so number one, the front-end development ecosystem is very vast, so don't be intimidated. Don't uh, don't be intimidated because you may you may think there's just too much to learn. But yes, just pick pick one thing and master it. Like right now, I there was a time I was doing Vue.js, then I was doing Angular, then I was doing React. I mean, when I when I began uh, my journey, I, I used to try a lot of things. And the reason I used to try a lot of things is because I want to get like a vast experience. And I wanted, I wanted to be ready for different jobs. But then the more you mature in the game, you, the more you realize that you actually need to focus on that one thing and be really, really good at it. And if I had spent more time on one thing, I would have been so much better. But yeah, in the beginning, it's also good to just test different things so that you know exactly what you want. Then, yeah, learn just in time. Yeah, that's another really important thing to do. Like when you're learning, don't uh, don't don't force yourself to learn things that you're not using immediately. Create, I mean, come up with reasons why you need to use something, and then go and build it. So when you're learning, always make sure you're learning and you're actually applying it in a certain concept. Yeah, and the imperfection is fine. Sometimes you may think you're not ready to apply for a job or you're not ready to work on a certain project because you've not really like mastered React so you can't start write, writing a React project or you haven't mastered some basics in say TypeScript so you don't wanna use TypeScript yes, yet. I think that's the wrong mentality to have. Be ready to actually start using stuff. The moment you just get an idea of how it's, how it's being used, be ready to pick it up and be ready to experiment and that's how you grow. And then keep practicing and intentional pressure to learn. Yeah. Intentional pressure to learn. That's that's really important. So, like for instance, right now, for me to present to you guys, to make this presentation today, I had to give myself enough reasons why I needed to this one to be done. And uh, like it, it gave me a lot of push. Like I had to learn so many things in preparation for this presentation, and also for for an interview that I was doing uh, a few weeks back. So it it gave me a lot of pressure to learn and to learn quickly because I didn't want to embarrass myself. So always sign up for different opportunities that you think are going to require you to know something in advance. So you just sit around and say, ah, oh, I have to learn first and then apply you're going to wait for a very long time, but you need to actually apply and then it gives you more reason to learn faster. Okay, so I'm going to go through the comments. How do you come up with the user interfaces? That is Joseph Shuri. So interfaces, I, I write my user interfaces just, uh, I write them using React and if you're asking about the design, I I try to make my design as simple as possible, especially when I'm trying to build features, just to present, like to demonstrate features. For example, in this case, I just wanted to demonstrate to someone how to do exactly what you're seeing here. And that didn't, I, I made sure it, it won't take me too long to do that. So if I had to learn, like say, right now, I'm trying to learn Tailwind CSS. If I had to learn that, it would have taken me more time to do that. So just pick the easiest thing to, to learn uh, or easy, easiest toolkit to apply here. And that was Skeleton CSS. So you can use different frameworks. If you prefer Bootstrap or whatever, yeah. Yeah, I like that comment from Haron. Don't wait to master everything to apply for jobs. Just start now. Yeah, exactly. What's your view on AI and web dev? Well, that's a very general question. <laughs> I, I don't have, uh, I don't have, I haven't, I haven't been following up enough, but I know there is, uh, 
is stuff like GPT-3 that people are working on. Uh, it's like, this is an AI. Let's Google it really quickly. So, yeah, this is a model, deep learning model that has has been able to demonstrate that it can develop websites based on being given like descriptions of what the website should look like. And it's really quite impressive. So it's, uh, I mean, there's been, there have been people who who are uh, fearing that it may take, 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 take our jobs as web developers, but I'm pretty sure that's not gonna happen anytime soon because for you to be able to develop websites, you need to have really, really good um, like description of what is expected on the website. So, and clients can't really do that without the help of other humans who are called the web devs. So you need to work together with the web developers to be able to develop that. I've been doing C sharp dev and debug code. We use breakpoints. I'm coming to front end dev. How can I do the same for TypeScript? Okay. How to write breakpoints in TypeScript? Just check that out. I mean, there's a lot of material already about how to do exactly that. How to write breakpoints. So one thing is to debug. Um, let's go directly to breakpoints. Doesn't look like that has been. Well, I've I've written the points on JS before. I think it used to be. Let's go with JavaScript. I think it's just the same way you will do with JavaScript. Let's write a debug function. I'm not wrong. Yeah, you, don't, you just write this in the within your code somewhere. That just work. Whenever you do this, uh, let me just try that here and see if it will work. I hope you don't break up my code. So this was sorry, this is a API. I wanna write it on the API, you can write it in your see if that will help change anything. Hmm. Taking forever to load. <sighs> okay, so in short, I am 
I will say, yeah, as you can see here, it's post in debugger. This one is where the breakpoint was added. And as you can see, you just need to write debugger and you, it will open up your source map. Sorry, it will open up the code where you wrote the breakpoint and be able to log something before and after the debugger. If you just press play, and you'll be able to run the rest of the code. It will render. So you see, it didn't render. It created the Apollo client, but it didn't render until you actually jumped across the debugger line. I think that answers the question. So same thing as you would do in JavaScript. Guys, any more questions? Ross, uh, I think I'm done with my presentation. I had only one request. Uh, so I am looking for an intern. I'm looking for an intern. Someone is asking about hosting. I'll, I'll, get, back, I'll get to that in a bit. So I want to hire an intern. Uh, Someone who has some basic uh, experience in AppScript, uh, React, and uh, GraphQL. If you can demonstrate some basic experience in AppScript, React, and GraphQL, uh, feel free to reach me at uh, mtruston. Or okay. Or uh, one second. Or DM me on Twitter. Yeah, and I, yeah, this is something I'm paying for, and I, I pay really well as compared to other in, other companies that are that need interns, and it's also a remote position. Yeah. So you just send me a link to any repo that you have uh, on GitHub. Right. Okay, so how about hosting? Yeah. Yeah, this code is hosted already. It's right here. And when you, when you have to do hosting, man, that, that was really quite, it was a headache for me, but I got it to work. So what I did, I have a server, I have a droplet, uh, server droplet on digital ocean. Uh, this is where I buy my servers, or I basically uh, pay for my virtual computers that serve my websites. And then I have uh, linked my domain to my VPS, virtual private server, that is on DigitalOcean. So this domain, teamtruston.com, is linked. And I've created a virtual... Uh, an Nginx, I'm using Nginx as a reverse proxy server. I, I don't know if you guys are aware of Nginx. So if you're a backend developer, you may know Nginx. And that one is able to reverse proxy the traffic that is coming to this domain. It's being reverse proxied to uh, this website that is running here. So if you if I log in, I hope someone's not gonna hack into my um actually let me let me let me just um temporarily 
log in here and then I share my screen again. So I will just quickly Okay, you can apply for the internship. Joseph Mboku, you have experience view JS TypeScript Apollo Graph QL. Yes, you can apply, although I will require you to know React because a lot of the work that I'll be giving you to do is in React. So I'm going to share my screen again. But kindly just apply as well. I'll, I'll share my screen and uh, there you go. So I just logged in. I just logged in to my server and I just changed the directory to where my virtual private servers are. Sorry, my Nginx configurations are. I will list them, there's just a ton of them here. And there's actually, I just want one of them and that'll be, oh yeah, in Phoenix. So this is a file right here that I need to care about. Um, yeah, as you can see here, we have. I don't know this file is really. Let me just. Uh, this. Let me do it again. Yeah, this is a file that basically. Uh, creates a configuration to re reverse proxy to the where my code is on my server. Code is uh, on a certain folder, and I'm running, I'm running, I'm running it locally, like on the server. And then traffic that comes to the to the domain is proxied to that. Um, that uh to that host to that port on my server okay i hope that answers it there's a lot that goes into it uh, there's these documents you need to read about how to do a vps server Near reverse proxy to uh, React or the reverse proxy to uh, yeah, Node.js. Yes, because all these are Node.js. Yeah. So if you don't have any more questions, um, I will beg to end my presentation right now because I'm already exhausted. I've been pre preparing all morning and I think I've actually presented enough. Yeah. I will organize a follow-up presentation. Hold up. I'll organize a follow-up presentation where I'll present a chat up. There's a chat up that I was working on earlier, but it didn't work out for some reason. So I'd like to present that again. 
on a different call. Right, Ross? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, it was a pleasure having you around, Timothy, uh, um, for the work you've done. You've showed us during this Code Lab session today, and we've all learned from you, from your experiences, and also from the fact that you shared an opportunity with us, the internship opportunity. We are really grateful for that. So uh, the meeting has ended until next time. So uh, this is the time.